tiny methamphetamine YouTube channel. <laughs> so um, we talked a bit before. Yeah, based in Melbourne right now. Very happy to have you. It's often very difficult with the timing. Uh, Australia, Europe, and South America. Mm. <laughs> so it's often very hard. And we are we are lucky actually. We had a few from Australia. Meanwhile, Abraham Elin, we interviewed also. If you know, a uh, very nice guy also. And uh, yeah, I mean, you are a very special project. It's a very very special life. Uh, you said style. How did you find that style? I think. I mean, in the end, it was where we are now is really just an endpoint of us trying just to be ourselves. Um, you know, everyone is quite unique in how we all are within the world. And the thing is, is that often uh, as younger musicians, you know, we first learn by copying the other musicians and bands that we love. And so, I, and then sometimes we get good at that and we stop exploring. Um, and we just emulate. And I think for us, from the very beginning, the intention was to 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 do new and interesting things. And then part of that was just a natural progression of that we had six quite different people in the band with some very different ideas. And some of them would be kind of unnight, see what it sounds like. And then sometimes we would be like, well, I don't know if other people will like this, but we think it's cool. <laughs> And so over the years, it's been kind of a pleasant surprise to find that, uh, you know, people are really connected with um, the music that we're doing because really, I mean, we've always worked very hard with the intention of making the band um, the highest quality possible. But at the same time, in the early years of the band, you know, we didn't think that we would ever, you know, do much beyond a very small underground level because we thought that, hey, you know, we're playing that kind of weird music with violin and blah, 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 and combining all these different things and surely that won't be that popular. So, uh, you know, we're hardly Metallica, but, um, you know, it's been really amazing just the support that that we get, um, especially now and, and with the new stuff that we've just started to release, um, it's been just very heartening for sure. Mm -hmm. I was hearing the, you know, the the last song, uh, and it's so long to be a single, and it's so nice the video, you know, it's it's like a a very ecological sound. I mean, uh, about the um, the images and the sound um, and all that you show there, is is that um, a, a point of uh, of the next album is gonna be like that? Um, I think that, well, first of all, thank you for the nice, nice words about um, uh, the single Equas. I mean, I think that um, often people, yeah, are surprised, like, oh, it's like a 12 and a half minute video as a single, like, we we don't, we don't really care, you know. Um, it's just, we thought this song is a good representation of like a blend of the different sounds that we do and that are featured on the record. Um And that was really behind the choice of that. And I was like, yeah, this is the best song to kind of represent the album overall. And however long it was, um, it didn't really matter. Um, I And I guess for, from there, it was it was then going, okay, a 12 half minute video is a bit tricky to make it interesting the whole time. So then it was uh, the challenge of trying to work out what are we going to do for this video? And then we actually filmed the video in in lockdown because the video was actually filmed last uh, well in 2021, um, and uh, half of the band was separated from each other, um, which was the reason why Zen and I are the only band members that feature in that video, because uh, um, we were like, well, oh, we can't get these two guys in, and so what do we do? And then in the end, we end up getting a separate film crew to France just to film Benji's guitar solo. Because we were like, oh, this is such a big moment in the song. We really need to feature it. Um, so it was a bit challenging trying to work out how to do that. But the video direction, you know, um, our vocalist Zen, um, you know, directs, um, is like the creative director for that video, um, which uh, is, it just came out really, really well. We have Dave Hunter, who is from a great Australian um, progressive metal band called Circles. He does a lot of um, music videos and, Um, he he shot the whole thing and did an incredible job 
Bob and he edited uh, the Equus video as well. Um, and then we had the same team work together on our next single, Growl, which is actually out later today, about 14 hours from now at the time of this interview. So by the time this goes up, I guess it will probably already be out. Um, and uh, and that once again was the same team, but then with that one, actually Zen even edited the music video also. Um, so just, I guess that ability to do stuff in-house um, and be really heavily involved in doing things for ourselves helps because then we can really take our time. And, you know, I really kind of believe that it's, uh, I'm often of the view that, that no one's going to work harder for your band than yourself, which is why I manage the band, which is why, you know, Zen does these videos. Like he also does the artwork, the, the covers and all, all the other different types of the merch designs. And so we do a lot of stuff in-house and very independent um, minded in that way. Mm -hmm. That sounds like there's a huge creativity in the background, <laughs> creating music videos of high frequency music by itself, uh, maintaining the whole show, managing everything. The production of a video can be quite complex. So where do you draw your energy from? Yeah, well, I think that the main thing is trying to work out what different members are good at and giving um, them roles that fit with that. Um, and so, you know, for Zen is such a great example because um, he's brilliant vi visually um, uh, aside from as a vocalist. And so, um, you know, when we're thinking about music videos, he's the one with all of these interesting visual ideas um, and the ideas for the merchandise and the album cover and the, you know, 16 page expanded booklet versions you know he's the one with all those different ideas about how to do that he does the band photos even as well um and and so i think when there's something that you're passionate about and you really get it um that that energizes you and you have the energy to do that when you're being asked to something that's maybe not your thing that can be really hard because it's a lot of extra mental energy to really connect into something that's not your strength so uh, you know as much as possible we, we try to um you know work to our strengths you know like one of one of my strengths is i i do think outside the box a lot just in everything managed and run um the way that the music is put together you know i'm normally the one saying hey what if we took this song and the song gets a little longer and longer like that's normally my fault um and uh you know, and like little things like just that ability to, you know, way back in the day, you know, Matt was the one who wrote the original acoustic guitar idea for and play Fowl's Kaleidoscope, which is one of our most um, popular songs. Um, but he didn't think it would be in one of our songs because it was like uh, not metal at all. Whereas I was the one going, hey, what if we tried to turn that into a metal song, you know, and it became like a challenge. Like, let's take this little flop, you know, kind of flamenco -y sounding type thing, this Latin-y vibe, um, and um, and turn it into something that, you know, is fits with what we do. Um, and so I had different ideas, and I tried to do that on the business side and the creative side, and then um, utilize the, the wonderful members that we have for the things that they're all, you know, really amazing at in their own rights as well. Mm -hmm. Wow, sounds like great teamwork. Partially, I heard myself talking as a CEO of a company. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a great team, apparently, uh, and, and, and you need to, be, to, to really bring the product out uh, of the and struggle with that or how does it get one video out and so many participants you said yeah, it varies song to song. So, I mean, back in the day, you know, we used to rehearse like every Sunday, like all day, we would get in a rehearsal room all together and rehearse. And then in between, we would kind of do our own practice. Since, uh, um, I guess, after Citadel came out, um, our lead guitarist, uh, Benji, moved back to France because that's where he's from originally. And um, from there, I mean, by that stage, most of us kind of had home recording studios. Um, I'm sitting here in my home studio at the moment. I actually recorded some of the vocals for the album in this room. Um, and uh, we started getting more in the habit of, you know, demoing ideas that we have up front and then just sending them around, sending the different demo files um, around via email 
and dealing with people that way. So that's kind of how, like how, where we kind of uh, co- collaborate, work together. Um, but a lot of the songs come from different places. So, f- you know, for example, um, you know, one song might be, you know, Benji sending through a two or three minute idea of guitar riffs with program drums underneath. And then if everyone really likes it, we might then see who else has ideas to maybe add to that to turn it into a proper song. Um, but then who starts the song can be quite different. So, you know, um, you know, one of the songs on this record, uh, Growl, actually, the, the the basis for the song was actually written by our uh, by our bassist Martino. Um, excuse me. Um, by our bassist Martino. Um, and uh, that was really... Uh, fantastic because originally it was um You know, like when you, whenever you be on their own parts. So, you know, Tino was brought in because he's an incredible bass player and we knew they could really create bonus out of there. Um, and then working within that that member. On the other hand, something like uh, Misery Chord Part Two, um, we had a jam session when we were in Australia for a tour back in May 2019. Um, and I had a little uh, chord progression idea that I'd written on piano. Um, and I taught it to the guys on guitar, which was the beginning of that. Um, and we just kind of jammed it and we recorded that jam session. And then I went home and I put together a demo with all the different ideas that we'd done. And then after that, I wrote all the strings and everything because that was one that I kind of wrote um, a lot of. Um, and it kind of went from there. So each of them kind of comes from a different place. Now, honestly, because we are very different, so we don't always agree because we are coming from really different places. And it, it is sometimes a compromise of someone coming from this direction, someone coming from that one, and maybe they don't match. And it's like, okay, well, these ideas are totally different. How do we make that work? But it's the ability to work through that process that is what creates our music. So that's a very important part of everyone kind of understanding that it's not it's not your ideas, not my ideas or whatever that are most important. It's the song and it's the album. And so sometimes it is that thing of going, oh, this is a really good idea, but maybe it's not right for the flow. And so we have to do something different. And But it's, it's, it is difficult sometimes because we have, um, you know, a few people that make significant tr- contributions. Um, I always think that it's probably easier in the bands where just one guy writes all the music. Um, and and uh, as far as no arguing, but... The thing is, we can't we can't do that because um, our sound is not created that way. Our sound is a blend of the the members in the band, and that's always been the way that it is. And it's an important element to how we got that sound. You know, going back to that first question that you asked, you know, how we got the sound is by letting everyone have a, a big um, role in, in the band. And it's not it 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 like that, isn't it? I mean, from from the very beginning from when uh, you were just a four pieces band um all the time you did you work like that um i mean like from from the very beginning it was it was a, a lot more i guess uh you know us just jamming in a room together and trying out ideas on the spot and it's a bit easier to do that when you can just try it out an idea quickly in the jam room yeah. and then you know straight away if it works or not Whereas when you're in different countries and you say, hey, try out this idea, maybe that person has to spend a bunch of time like learning the idea and doing a demo or whatever, because you're not in the same room. You can't just like quickly teach it to them or whatever. It's, it's a little bit slower. So it makes it a little bit more difficult. But on the other hand, there's the huge benefit of the fact that we we use, um, we, we are able to do such high quality pre-production now because we have our home studios. Um, and so the quality of the, the preparation in writing the songs is a lot better. But like over the years, I mean, who who is in the band has changed. I mean, Zen and I are the kind of two founding members, um, but, you know, Matt's been in the band since 2004. So, you know, only one year after Zen and I, um, Benji, 2008, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, so a, a lot of us have been there a long time. 
Um, but that process of kind of, you know, uh, me working in with um, other members um, to create different elements um, has always kind of been the same. It's just depending on who who, who is there sometimes has changed a little bit over the years. Um, but that, that process is similar, just moved more into that, I guess, online element because, you know, we, we are in three different countries now, the band. Right. Right. How excited is uh, the upcoming tour uh, in the United States? I, I was checking, uh, you're going to play like uh, Persephone, for example. They're awesome. I love them. And and I love your own yes. material, yeah. your, your, your new material, you know, from the last album and the next one that I want to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, the... Um... Uh, the tours we're so excited about, you know, we have Europe, UK coming up this May, um, US, Canada coming up in October, November. Um, we're working on tours for Australia, um, Asia and Latin America as well. Um, and so and we've never yes. been to, yeah, Latin America. Um, <laughs> so Federico already happy. <laughs> no, no further. Yeah. No. So, <laughs> um yeah. yeah so so you mentioned persephone so I, i'm i'm the manager for persephone um and so so i actually booked their they're, they're coming to uh argentina yeah. just in six March weeks or something two. two yeah so i so i booked that show um for them um and so uh, so part of this thing is like I, i'm booking their latin american tour and then and then next i'll book one for us <laughs> But, uh, um, but okay, we have some other things to do first. But <laughs> well, that's definitely on the horizon. So we, we haven't started on that process yet. I have started talking to a couple of promoters, but um, the first half of 2024 is where we're thinking because this year is pretty busy um, as it is. I think between like uh, North America, Europe, Australia, it'll be pretty full. But um, first half of next year, where the intention is try to do headline tours in Asia and Latin America. That's um, the plan. Um, and we really want to get everywhere because we're really proud of this new record. We really think it's, um, you know, a, a special album and, um, and we think that the songs have got to be great live and we, we want to share that with people because we know that that's, that's how you get people long-term interested in the band. You know, you listen to a record, you like the song and then you see the live band And that's when you go, okay, wow, you know, I'm, I want to uh, follow this band for a long time. Uh, I know that's what I'm like with bands. So maybe I'm just projecting <laughs> what other people's experience might be, but that's what I hope for. You know, I hope people come along, have a great time. And then instantly they're waiting for the next album. And, um, you know, we've been being asked to get to uh, Latin America for a long time. We've been to Mexico a couple of times, but we haven't been, mm -hmm. um, anywhere south of there. Um, and, um, But we know there's lots of interest and we get asked from fans uh, very often. And so the intention is hopefully go as many places as possible um, for this album, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, from my point of view, if you allow me a personal word, you are really at the stage. You really can make a flip with that tour, I think. I mean, I've met that in 30 years. I see bands coming up. It takes a long while for me that a new band uh, gets on my playlist. You are on my playlist. <laughs> it took a while, but you made it. I love your stuff, of course. And I really think that's a tipping point now to, to get more solidified and get a bit uh, bigger as a message out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, it's a different experience, the live show. And, and not, not all bands are great live. Um, you know, there are some bands that you, you love the record and you see them live and it's maybe not as good. Like it's, mm -hmm. you know, like, and uh, on the other way around, sometimes you have great live bands who their albums aren't as good, you know, but, but we've always, we always viewed ourselves as a band that was a really good live act. Um, and that was first, you know, before we had any albums out, you know, we were playing live for me for many years. And so that was what came first. And then it was trying to work out how do we make our albums um, as good as the live shows? Because we were like, well, we think the live shows are really good. We got to make sure the album matches that. And just you hear on the production, you know, you hear the changes in the production um, from album to album. And that is part of the uh, match um, as best as possible. Right. How 
much such a huge tour and then to spend so much time with your band members and the whole team on the road. It's difficult also your personal yeah. Yeah, it it is really tricky. Um, I mean, I think that as far as the everything's about having a good team um, to make it work. So, you know, so I, I manage the band, so I handle a lot of stuff with booking the world tour. But at the same time, you know, we have a wonderful booking agent um, over booking the European UK shows. We have a booking agent in North America um, who's booking. in shows um but you now hasn't been used in three years and getting it all tested <laughs> and um and, and making sure that's getting repaired and and getting the right people to test that because I, I can't test it and repair it myself so it's getting the right people to make sure that they're getting um everything sorted and checking if anything need to be replaced or upgraded and then going okay well we have to pay what a 10,000 euro bus deposit for Europe and we have to have that money before we get paid for the shows, you know, and solving all of these different things and going, okay, well, how do we do that? And I need to get a company business account for this travel agent so that they can put the flights on that account and then we can pay them. You know, there's a lot of different things in managing a band. And then that's not even uh, touching on the fact that is a 95 minute show that we need to rehearse and practice. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, that uh, is good stuff. <laughs> you know, and yeah, and and it's not that you know the music is. Um, I mean, it's natural to us because we we write it, but um, it's not easy. Like you know, you have to practice the stuff. Like if I don't practice rules and and um, all that sort of stuff. So you know, right right now we have about you know three three just over three months till we leave for the European tour and a lot of work to do just to make sure that we're ready for the first show. Um, because like the very first show that we ha we have is going to be in Helsinki on May 5. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's at the venue holds about 775 people. And I think there's, it'll, it'll be pretty packed and maybe hopefully it might sell out. And um, that's the first show in like almost <laughs> wow. four years. Um, oh, yeah. And so yeah. And so the, the comment within the band was like, hey, we need to um we need to make sure that we're really practice a lot because the first show is like bam, 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 big one, you know. Um yeah. but I, the last two, Yeah. And so um it takes a lot. I mean, you, you mentioned other work. So, you know, from once we took on managing the band, which is kind of late 2015, um we we launched our Patreon a few months later, which was you know we were the first band in the world to do that um, in in the way that it was um, that uh, that it was released, and um, from that point on, I, I didn't have any other work. I just worked on Nail Blue Scaris. Um, some of the other guys would go over and, and do part time work in between tours, um, but then my job was just to do all of the stuff I've been talking about because it is an enormous job in itself, and you do need someone dedicated to it. Um, and, but when the pandemic hit, uh, um, you know, we came home July, 2019 from European festivals and, uh, we were supposed to just be home for about 12 months, right? Record a new album, go back on the road. And then, you know, obviously that was not right. what happened. And, um, as a result, you know, like I went back to, to teaching violin, which was something I'd done, um, before kind of the band stuff took over. Um, all the guys just went back to their other jobs. You know, guys had to get new jobs if they weren't already doing things because uh, it's like with the other guys, they would often get fired if they toured too oh. much. So then they would come home maybe at the end of an album cycle and, and have to find a new job because, oh, hey, we've got too many tours this year. So when they asked for extra time off, they would get fired because it's like, oh, hey, God. you're never here. Um, and, and then when they came home for, hey, we're going to be home for a year, they would have to get a new job and, so that was kind of the challenge through the pandemic, um, people getting extra work to kind of just uh, to get by, which was tough. We're, we're very fortunate um, to still have a significant income through uh, our Patreon membership and the script subscriptions that we have on that. Uh, most bands, you know, no other bands really had things uh, to that level um, for bands our size. And so we're very fortunate with that. 
And then now it's that adjustment. You know, I have, you know, um, some violin teaching that I'm trying to wind back because the band stuff is getting so busy. Um, but at the same time, we're not getting paid anything yet because the albums are not out. We haven't done any tours. So it's like, yeah. I can't let, so it's just really busy time because, you know, I can't let go other work because there's no money coming in because the album's not out. The tours aren't happening. Um, yeah. So it's just trying to make it through to that. And then once the album's out, once we get it back on the road, as long as lots of people turn up and people buy the album, then, you know, hopefully things get back on track. Um, but we're very confident. Um, sales are really amazing for the tours and the feedback on the album so far for uh, the few that have heard it has been really positive. And obviously the single's done really great. So it's um, exciting. It's, it's it's an exciting time for the band. I'm pretty I, sure. I, really, I really love the, the idea of you playing here in South America and team. Uh, hopefully more than a Buenos Aires show. I'm not living in Buenos Aires. I'm living in Patagonia, which is like a 2,000 kilometers south. So hope you have yes. more than one gig in, in Argentina. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I think... Um, I don't know if they played a show, but I, I think like the ocean were Patagonia. Um, just like... An ocean? Uh, I must... A month um, I remember maybe it was on social media. Yeah, we we it's always uh, the intention of trying to play as many shows as possible. Yeah, right. who's playing now? So that is that a festival, Frida? Who's playing? This uh, now next one is Pestilence. Um, it was also Nervosa from Brazil. Um, at the gate from Sweden. Um, bands mm -hmm. like that were here at home. So yeah. we start slowly to compile our own festival in, in southern Argentina. <laughs> so location is uh, just nice. wonderful, it's just special. It's just so beautiful there. So yeah. Okay, so the songwriting process can be challenging. Is it the most challenging part uh, to to sync with the, with the band members, or are there other parts as well, like lyrics or getting a message really across in one song? Um, or to perfectionize one song? Do you get stuck in the process sometimes? Uh, do you want to make it better, but you don't know how? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, I think that um, the lyrical process is pretty easy because we just leave that to Zen. Um, Zen writes the lyrics, <laughs> sure. um, and he pretty much sends them through. The only, um, I guess the only other person involved, involved in the lyrics is myself because I also sing. Um, and so him and I will have a bit of back and forth sometimes about the lyrics for my parts, but it's never really that I'm writing the lyrics. It's more just that, Hey, this particular word or a syllable doesn't suit the, the note that I want to sing. Like I might, because often I write my melodies first and I send Zen like a, the guitar riff and the melody recorded just with no words. Um, and then, uh, he will write lyrics that are similar to the melody uh, and then it might be like oh this word doesn't sound good on a long note you know can we change it or um or something like that so there'll be a bit of back and forth in that regards but that's normally pretty um stress-free um because it is mostly zen's thing um and uh and we work together really well regardless um it's definitely tricky in the songwriting process we do get stuck sometimes um, you know, there are songs that get set aside and never finish. If we finish a song, it's because we think it's awesome. Um, <laughs> so we don't really have like B sides to release because, um, it's a lot of work to finish like a 12 minute song. And <laughs> if, if there's something not working, we just, we never finish it because we get, we do get stuck and we go, well, hey, we're up to the four minute mark and what do we do here? Or maybe the vibe of it or the flow is not working um and we're experimenting with ideas normally there's like a song or two per album that that happens to um that you guys just never get to hear uh, um every now and then every now and then you know there are riffs from those songs that they then get pulled aside um i mean i remember that um you know i'm trying to think back back a bit you know when we had way back on Citadel with Deval Me Colossus, you know, maybe about uh, three or four minutes into the song, 
we kind of went off into this kind of black metal-y riff. Um, this is in the original version, not the album version. Um, in this completely different direction, we had like a good like two or three minutes of music written, but the the change the change from one bit to the next bit at a particular riff wasn't quite flowing that well. And we were trying this and we were trying that. And it's like, ah, it's not quite working. Um, and so in the end, like we had a different idea, which was this acoustic thing. And um, I think, uh, I, I can't remember, I can't remember who wrote it. It doesn't really matter, but it was one of the other guys. And I think I had the idea, well, can we try taking this bit from this song and putting that over there in a different song? Um, and all of a sudden it flowed perfectly. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Well, that two or three minutes we had, we'd throw that in the bin. Um, and now we're going off in different direction. And I mean, that happened as well, actually, with the single Equas. Uh, Equas was actually originally a different song, uh, stuff that um, Benji had sent through. Um, and I kind of fleshed it out, turned it into a bit of a verse chorus thing, added a, added a bridge that I kind of wrote in there in amongst Benji's stuff. Um, and then, then it kind of went off in totally different directions to what you hear. Um, but the flow, once again, it was a matter of, I always am aiming for the song to flow seamlessly and to feel very natural in its progression. And there was a moment that felt forced. Um, and then later on, there was another moment that felt a bit forced and we kept trying different ideas and for a long time, and there was some disagreement about uh, how to try and solve that. And in the end, like Matt and I got together one evening and, and you know, um, all that other stuff, because we have about a 10 minute song written and the last six minutes, I'll just like, let's pretend that doesn't exist and get to this moment that isn't, isn't flowing at about the four minute mark. And just imagine like what could come next. Uh, um, if, if we were just writing something afresh without, without trying to make anything work, just like with completely fresh, like if we were just listening to the first, the song of the last eight and a half minutes, just hanging out at Matt's house one night and then send it back to the, and we send it back to the rest oh. of the band, say, hey guys, we tossed most of this song in the bin and rewrote it. <laughs> please, please check it out and listen to it before you make any judgments because like you know obviously it's like stuff people worked really hard on and a lot of it just got tossed aside and and um and that can be really awkward because people might really love their idea but then some of that stuff the stuff that got tossed aside there is great and one of those ideas i know that we've kind of already flagged oh we should try and work on that idea as something fresh for the next record or things like that because if something's really good enough we'll use it in the long run um but this is the the challenge of uh, go, of trying to not care about the ideas or not be too personal about the ideas and just go, is is this great? Is this the best thing that we can do? Um, and sometimes it's ex experimenting and it doesn't work. And we might go, we experiment, we experiment, we experiment. Um, and we go, no, you know what? What we've got is the best idea that we have. Um, and then it's like, is that good enough or is it not? You know, is it good, good enough to be on the record or is it not? But at least if you experiment, you know that you feel comfortable that that's the best that you can do. And I think that's the really important thing by that sort of experimentation where if we don't all agree, generally the agreement is to try some other things because often what happens is that if we're not all in agreement, if we try some different things, something else will be uh we'll we'll all jump on and go oh okay this we all agree on this this is great um and then that's the idea we move forward on um whereas previously maybe we you know uh, we were struggling oh, wow, to get through what a process. <laughs> i get tempted sometimes to take an old song and rewrite it or, or do a second version like unforgiven two and three or something like that <laughs> i get tempted to, to improve old songs um or you just get used to it and, and send it sad song and you can't imagine a different version anymore. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, not really as far as the songwriting because the songwriting for every song that we release, 
we've put so much work into it that at that time I couldn't imagine it any other way. Um, and then it's ha- then it's okay to move on going, well, that's a piece of art that exists in that time capsule um, that doesn't necessarily need to be changed. Having said that, I do sometimes wish we could change the production or the performances on some records. I mean, I listen to Portal of Eye and I think, I mean, it's that's a decade ago. I mean, I recorded vocals for that like over 12 years ago and I'm a much better singer now than I was back then. Um, and so I listen to Portal of Eye and I kind of go, oh, I don't really like the vocals anymore because I'm comparing <laughs> to to now and i go oh, i wish i could like redo that with now but that's what the live show is for you know um the the live show is to hear the band as we are now and you get to hear those old songs with the new today performance and so that's kind of i guess how i managed to avoid wanting to redo stuff because it's like um you just come to the live show and you can hear the today version of um, of it up to date <laughs> Uh, I think you have a, a great um, evolution, you know. Um, life is getting better because you put just the best songs, the new songs and the best songs at the same time. So I, I was uh, checking today the um, 70 Tons of Metal show. It was awesome. Yeah. You know, it was uh, 2019. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, one of the last shows, the last years of shows uh, from you. So uh, that. I, I have good good expectation for this 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 year we're gonna see the uh, the band isn't it Michael uh, around uh, Europe traveling some festivals and stuff sure somewhere I will I will find you somewhere I don't know I travel awfully awful lot so I never know in which city or where but Budapest Lisbon Madrid somewhere I will catch you for sure <laughs> I think it will be great um, yeah what is the future talking about the evolution of the band where does it lead to what is the future do you have a grand vision for example with a almost unlimited budget would you would you employ orchestra or what what is the future <laughs> ultimate version ah uh, i mean i mean I, yeah I, I daydream about all sorts of different things i mean i remember years ago talking to zen about the idea of doing something um like with a ballet company or um and like a wider string section or different things like that um but i think like for now i mean when i think about like the ultimate version of what we could do especially if, if there was um more budget you know it, it would be um things like maybe including like a like a string section in the live shows you know we're actually even looking at whether we can do that sometimes maybe including a string quartet or something because there are a lot of strings on the new stuff um more than i can play by myself <laughs> um and so uh you know, I think like for us, it's just continuing to explore new things, you know, so I always try to make the albums flow start to finish. You know, I, um, you know, I've been thinking for a while about the idea of a concept album that, that is a particular um, story or narrative that flows start to finish. Um, Cause we, our albums often are almost like that, but not quite. And so it feels like that would be something that would be fun to do, although a big challenge. Um, and and just continuing to explore, you know, on this new record, there's a little bit more viola. There's a couple you know, solo viola parts mm-hmm. mixed in on the record. Um, continue to explore that, maybe even bring in some more solo cello stuff. There's a couple of songs with um, cello parts on this record. And just continue to expand and explore different sounds. And so that's really when I think about the ultimate idea of the band, it would just be, to be continuing to push ourselves to do some new things and not just do the same record again. Um, I, I always, uh, I would find that very boring as an artist to be too similar. Um, so it's important for me to be ch- challenging and doing new things um, artistically. And then just, you know, um, try and do the best live show possible. You know, uh, we have this new video uh, um you know which is out uh later today growl and we have this wonderful fire dancer those sort of things but uh it's um the more people you have on the road it like it makes things very expensive um and so it's aspirational things that hopefully one day you know we have that sort of money um to be able to do you know extra special things um uh in due course mm. hopefully it's a tour 
it's the next part. Hopefully. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you were you were talking about Patreon. So and and obviously the, the band were one of the of, of the first ones to to use crowdfunding. How does it work for you? Still working? Yeah, it's been great. Um, I mean, we did a crowdfunding campaign for our world tour in 2014, um, and we raised um, over $86,000 Australian, which is about maybe $60,000 US roughly. Um, and uh, our original target of $40,000, we hit it in about 38 hours or 36 hours. Um, and it was the it was a record in Australia for the biggest um, music related crowdfunding campaign in Australia at the time. So that was really exciting because that showed that if we said to our fans, hey, um, if you support us, we will give back in the nature of guaranteed tours. Um, and they all went, hell yeah, um, uh, we are happy to support you. And then we did all the tours and it was great. The challenge for us after that was, of course, once that money dried up, we weren't making profits on tours. And it was like, well, we're still losing money on tours. How do we keep on the road now that the crowdfunding money is gone? And that's where we came up with this idea of doing a subscription service. When that um, idea came up late 2015, I had never heard of Patreon before. Um, and I kind of mentioned on our Facebook page that we're looking at doing this idea of maybe like a subscription service, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, um, would people be interested in that sort of thing? And it was in the comments that one of our fans mentioned like, oh, that kind of like sounds like, you know, what Patreon do a little bit. Uh, and we checked it out and thought, well, actually, this would be a pretty good uh, fit. Um, at that time, though, Patreon was really just for YouTube vloggers. Um, it, was, it was a way to get monetized for YouTube videos. Um, and uh, Amanda Palmer was using it um, for... Um, from the Dresden Dolls, uh, it was using it for uh, each each new thing that she released. It would, you know, get a guaranteed like payment. So it wasn't a monthly subscription. It was like every time she released something like a song or whatever it was, um, the membership fee would get processed. Um, and she was the only, you know, prominent musician in the world that I could find using it at all at that time. Everyone else was on just YouTube videos. Um, but th there wasn't any other bands in the world doing it beyond a very small level. You know, like I found a couple of small local bands with like 10 members or something like that, but no one that you'd had ever heard of or that um, was um, uh, doing it with much success. And so it was a, a bit of a, a risk because no one had ever done it before. And we were checking with Patreon, like, are there any other bands like doing this? And they're like, no, like you guys are the first one. So we were like the first band in the whole world. Yeah. Uh, to do this and now there's a lot and um and it's you know the thing is is that people forget because in 2016 we announced this and uh a lot of people had to go you're begging for money and blah blah, blah. and we said this is bullshit <laughs> bands deserve to be paid for what they do if if there is a market for it and we were like we have like tens of thousands of followers at that time i reckon we had about maybe you know, maybe 40,000, you know, followers on Facebook. And I'm like, we have all these people that want to support us. But they don't have a method to, and we get paid so little from album sales and we don't get any money for, we lose money on tour, but these people want us to tour. They want to support us. And so my um, idea at the time was saying, well, this, the system is broken and it's not supporting bands in the way that it should be. Uh, there was a lot of debate of success. I mean, I, I can't remember the figures off the top of my head, but, you know, we did, you know, we did a big um, news feature in like one of the biggest uh, newspapers here in Australia called the Australian, uh, the Australian newspaper. Um, and they did a big, big feature on um, this type of music. Um, um, that talked about how in that time, you know, uh, in Australian dollars, I mean, We, we must be getting close to a million dollars earned over the last seven years in Australian dollars, you know. I mean, I think it was, I've got to check the figures, but it, it sounds like a huge amount of money and because it is, because a lot of bands, they don't get any of that money. Um, and so you're pumping that in and that's literally how we've been able to do it as a part-time job, get on the 
or invest in tours where maybe we lose twenty five thousand on the tour, and it's like that's okay because we have this money to to spend. Um, and when you really break it down on spending that money between six people over like six seven years, it's actually like less than working at McDonald's. Hmm. Um, so it makes for a headline like that sort of figure, but not actually. You know, it's not actually a livable wage yet, but it's a huge thing and it is basically creates a part-time income just from the Patreon. You know, we still, as of today, we have about 6,000 US in monthly membership um, with, uh, you know, 700 plus members on board. Um, and that's gone down a lot because of the pandemic. Um, but we're just starting to advertise that again because of um, new album and, and things like that. So it really completely changed our career. And, um, you know, it, it's it's the reason why we've been able to tour, you know, because so literally most of the touring we've done around the world is because of the money that we got um, for Patreon from 2016 onwards. Um, and so it's been incredible. And, you know, it's been great to see a lot of bands, you know, copy that idea over the years. It took a while. Um, before people got the confidence because there was that bit of a, a negative stigma about it. But now, you know, lots of bands uh, and musicians are doing it, which is which is great. Um, and also doing other things as well, you know, whether they're streaming on Twitch or whatever. Like the whole point is, is that there's got to be more ways for musicians to make money because it can't be that just because you're a metal musician, you you have to be broke. It's, it's not cool to be broke. I have a 10-year-old daughter. I have to put food on the table. I got to pay my rent, you know. Yeah. And I spent like 20 years studying to be a professional violinist. Like I'm a highly trained professional musician, just like a doctor or or whatever else. What I chose to do was to work my ass off, practicing three, four hours a day for years uh, as a violinist and as a musician, as a composer, writer. Um, and musicians, you know, deserve to be paid if there is support for what they're doing. So not every musician can um, get a lot of money. Like, there's a lot of musicians who would like to be. Um, but it's about making sure that if you have fans there, that there's a way for them to support you in a way that is fair and reasonable with not everyone else getting paid first, like the record label and the publicist and the record store yeah. and the promoter and the, all that sort of stuff. And that's not saying that that's not good. Like those people do important things in the music scene, but the musicians, you know, if they don't like most bands, if they never get paid, eventually they have to quit because, it becomes unsustainable. So you get a lot of musicians getting like, I'm 40 years old. A lot of bands, they get into their forties, they have families and kids and they quit because they've never got to the stage of being able to make a profit from the band and they just can't do it anymore. And so the more bands can keep going that we can support financially, the better. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, I think that's the really interesting. Is beautiful. It's a beautiful method for crowdfunding for sure. Like it's direct support that the chance can support the band directly. And I mean it's a win-win situation in that case, I think. So, so yeah. And also, I mean, it sounds like me just burns away in the operational business. It is just like that. As you mentioned, you have costs, two of us, fees, uh bookings and so on. It's uh it's not that yes. okay. Peter? Well, no, it's a lot of time with Tim. He's a very interesting guy, you know, as a awesome musician, pro producer, CEO, <laughs> everything, manager. So <laughs> but, um, we, we are very happy to talk with you, man. Thank you so much, Tim, for the time. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having me and, uh, and for the chat. Hope to okay. see you soon.